Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Um, happy to see uh, new faces and uh, uh, not so new faces. Um, so just to introduce, Robert is uh, the first visiting researcher of this year. Uh, he's been here for two months and it's, there's one more month left. Uh, and so he's uh, doing his PhD in uh, the philosophy of ecology in Bielefeld mm -hmm. and uh, working on uh, epistemological and metaphysical questions on, on biodiversity uh, in, in theory and in conservation. So there's also this, I think he has this interest in bridging gaps within uh, philosophers and scientists. And I think he's uh, going to talk to us today a bit about uh, these topics. So yep. Yeah, Thanks. Um, uh, thank you for the for the introduction um, to give a talk here. Um, so uh, I will not uh, talk in French. Um, <laughs> as I think uh, it's most beneficial to all of us. Um, so so the title of the talk is defending a multidimensional concept of biodiversity, um, uh, and it is also it should also be um, a, a wrap up or a, a description of the problem situation of <coughs> biodiversity. Um, and then adventuring into one specific problem. Um, now, in hindsight, I would have better called it exploring a multidimensional concept because the more I think about it, um, the less <laughs> the less I am I am convinced of that it is actually a defendable position. But yeah, but maybe <laughs> maybe you can help me out. That's why it's the work in progress talk. Is fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I also I also have highlighted the the, the work in progress parts. So. Um, just to make sure. So let me jump right in um, to a, uh, a general description of the, the problem situation of, of biodiversity from a philosophical perspective. So um, on the one hand, um, biodiversity um, is, of course, ha has earned a very prominent place um, in, 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 a very, in a very short time. So there's the UN Convention on Biological Diversity from 92. We have the IG biodiversity targets, although they have partially um, failed by 2020. There is the Intergovernmental Science uh, and Policy Platform, um, so very much like its, its older cousin, the IPCC. And of course, currently, there are the negotiations for the new global biodiversity framework, um, which are all uh, policies developed um, at a global level. But the, the concept of biodiversity has also gained um, traction in the scientific context. So while the, the, uh, the roots um, of the diversity concepts may be traced to theoretical ecology in the 1950s anyway, um, this new term biodiversity then also uh, quickly gained traction in the scientific literature. So specifically in community ecology, um, many of the key questions, so what drives community structures, how does uh, uh, anthropogenic or other environmental influences change community structure are uh, framed in terms of questions of what are the drivers and consequences of changes in biodiversity. Um, and besides that, of course, it is also very prominent, prominent in taxonomy and systematics um, and in evolutionary biology, um, and <coughs> of course, as well in conservation biology. So at first glance, it might seem that the biodiversity concept, because it is so widely used um, in many different contexts, um, is a reasonably successful and powerful concept that is able to connect the scientific and the political users and also contributes to providing an evidential basis for conservation decision making, um, not only at the national, but of course foremost at the global level. Um, Despite this appearance, however, or maybe precisely because of it, um, the concept of biodiversity is also notoriously controversial. Um, so I want to distinguish at least uh, three reasons or three problem areas why uh, we might think that, that biodiversity is problematic. So first, of course, we are lacking um, still a consistent uh, definition. Um, we have considerable philosophical controversy, um, not only to definitional issues, but concerning the very nature of the concept. Um, and I then will also distinguish two forms of conceptual uncertainty um, that, also to, that also contribute to epistemic um, and as a consequence also ethical risk um, with respect to the concept. So concerning the first point, um, a, a, as I already said, a unifying and universally accepted definition of biodiversity is still absent. Um, and also, um, given the state of discussion, unlikely to appear, appear on the horizon anytime soon. 
So while it is most generally and broadly defined just as the variety of life at multiple levels of organization, um, it has repeatedly been uh, pointed out that this definition is unsuitable because it would essentially collapse the concept <coughs> of biodiversity with the totality of biological entities um, and that furthermore uh, it is impossible to operationalize in conservation practice um, but also in a scientific context. Um, so because it seems fundamentally impossible just to, to um, have a complete um, assessment of biodiversity of any place if biodiversity is understood thus broadly, um, the concept seems to me seems to lose um, any practical or even theoretical significance. Um, so in practice, therefore, definitions of biodiversity are then oftentimes um, restricted by explicitly um, limiting them to specific dimensions or levels of organizations. So the, the most prominent and well-known such restriction is the definition that is given in the UN Convention of 1992 in Article 2, um, which reads, biological diversity means the variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia terrestrial, marine and other aquatic ecosystems and the ecological complexes of which they are part. So this includes diversity within species, between species um, and of ecosystems. So um, this, is, this is most commonly used a restriction to um, genetic variability, taxonomic diversity um, and diversity of ecosystems basically. Um, however, even this um, conventional restriction of the definition um, is by no means universally shared. So there are many different um, such specific definitions around. Um, I think in, in the 1990s they long counted at least over 80, I think it was 86 different ones of them in the literature. Um, and so far there also does not seem to have emerged really a broad consensus. Um, but this is not only an, an exercise um, in conceptual and linguistic reg regimentation, um, it is argued that these oftentimes subtle differences between these definitions um, can be problematic um, in specific contexts. So um, it has been pointed out that reaching agreement on conservation programs, um, which is already a thorny issue for various reasons, um, is systematically impaired if there is no consensus on definitions or otherwise conceptual uncertainty um, concerning the, um, the goals and aims of the, of the conservation effort. And likewise, um, there is the worry that different definitions of biodiversity, if they are not made um, explicit, uh, could, also, could also seriously hamper or undermine um, conservation programs or impede the uh, impede conservation programs by essentially hiding um, differences and incompatibilities between different approaches under the general and then unclearly understood um, umbrella concept of biodiversity. So it is no wonder then that the, that the concept of biodiversity has also provoked philosoph philosophical controversy and critique. Um, there are currently several different philosophical approaches to the concept of biodiversity, so I only want to mention three of them um, just briefly here. Um, one of the earliest is perhaps the proposal by Saho Krasaka to be deflationary with respect to the concept of biodiversity, um, a, a position that he um, argued and developed um, over a series of, of papers and books. Um, so, and, and according to this view, we should um, give up on the project of trying to explicitly define biodiversity anyway, because if there is such a definition, biodiversity can only be implicitly defined um, as the outcome of the process of systematic conservation planning. So, systematic conservation planning um, is a somewhat formalized procedure that covers many steps um, that also include decision theory and, and multiple criteria analysis. But the, the biodiversity part of it, um, the idea is basically that an area um, of concern is represented, rep represented in a geographical map. Um, and then we um, have um, a grid layer over the geographical map. Um, and we start by um, 
uh, finding out the biodiversity um, content or representation of each of these individual grids based on surrogate choices that we make um, based on values, conventions or norms or whatever. So this may be uh, the representation of a particular species, it may be the species richness insofar as we have the data, but it may also be based um, on a notion of habitat diversity. Um, and we then have algorithmic procedures by which we can maximize the total representation of biodiversity um, based on the rule of complementarity and our initial choice of surrogates. So this is, this is the basic idea of this process. Um, and the suggestion by Saka is then, well, that this process and the algorithms that determine the choice um, of, the, of the grids um, implicitly define the concept of biodiversity. Um, so this is a, this is a very fully worked out suggestion. So the, the the process of systematic conservation planning is, however, the idea that this is um, an implicit definition of biodiversity is, I think, problematic for several reasons. Um, so first of all, as a consequence, this would restrict um, legitimate uses of the concept of biodiversity to conservation biology. Um, and Saka is also very explicit about this point um, and emphasizes it frequently that it should only thus be used. Um, however, I think given the centrality of the biodiversity concept in community ecology um, and the importance of this research for the biodiversity and ecosystem <coughs> function um, debate, it seems to be unreasonable um, to restrict the use of the concept of biodiversity in such a way. Um, apart from the question of whether, whether should such large-scale regimentation of the usage is even possible. Um, but even more problematic is the use of the concept of implicit definition um, in, in this context. So um, I think Saka really intends this use of implicit definition to be anal analogous to what Hilbert, David Hilbert does in the foundations of geometry. So in the sense we have an axiomatic definition of the concepts of point, um, plane and line, um, in the sense that everything that satisfies the axioms um, counts um, as, as point, plane um, or line. Um, but but I, I, so it's, it's easy to see that this analogy quickly breaks down because the uh, algorithms that are used in systematic conservation planning do not axiomatize the field of conservation biology. Um, also, geometry is a highly formalized field, whereas conservation biology is, of course, um, empirical. Um, and it is not really clear uh, how, uh, without an incorporation into a coherent formalized system, um, these algorithms could be interpreted as providing an implicit definition um, of the concept of biodiversity. Um, and lastly, also, there is this point made by Justice, by Jack Justice recently, um, that axioms and algorithms are just logically distinct categories of statements, um, of, of sentences. So while axioms um, are assertions that are true functional, um, the algorithms are generally of the form if x then do epsilon um, and it is not clear how such uh, a statement can be too functional or can confer meaning on a concept. So yeah, well, well I think this, this idea of implicitly de defining biodiversity may have some intuitive appeal. Um, I think that actually as a theory of, uh, of, of what, how the concept of biodiversity should be defined, it doesn't really work. So, but um, Saka did also move towards um, a more normativist position um, in recent years. Um, so this, this would be the second, um, the second type of uh, approach to, to the philosophy of biodiversity that I would want to discuss. Um, this is normativism. So the idea is, well, if we already have um, so many differences in defining the concept, maybe the reason for this is that biodiversity itself is somehow normative or regulating um, and consequently that it must be defined with recourse to non-epistemic values or value judgments. Um, and this, this, of course, this idea that biodiversity is somehow value-laden or a normative idea, this, this has been floating around since the, since the 1980s um, when the concept came up, um, but it has never really been um, 
explicitly defined or explicated what this could mean. Um, one somewhat systematic um, exposition of this idea is by, by Brian Norton, um, who argues that well, biodiversity should refer to those aspects of natural variety that are socially important enough to obligate protection of those aspects for nature um, for future generations. Um, so this is a, a proposal for a normative definition based on a descriptive criterion, so it exemplifies natural variety, um, and a specific normative criterion that it warrants protection for future generations. Um, and, and we can see why people might think that such a definition is appropriate in defining biodiversity as the normative goal of conservation biology, um, if, if one assumes that this should be the primary function of the biodiversity concept. But of course this approach also simultaneously seems to solve the definitional problem of biodiversity in navigating the generality of the concept and then the specificity that we need in order to make it operational. So Norton's definition is very general in the sense that it builds off of this notion of biological variety, but it is also very specific in that it only includes elements um, that satisfy this normative criterion. Um, and, and, and for, for Norton, this, this seems to uh, follow directly from, from the nature of the concept. So what he writes is, when we think about sci uh, apparently scientific concepts like biodiversity in a conservation context, we are forced to conclude that we cannot know what we mean until we know what we care about. Um, <coughs> so as the, the reasoning goes, since we will never find a correct unifying definition of biodiversity anyway, uh, because of the very nature of the concept, we might as well shift our conceptual attempts towards coming up with a definition that satisfies practical needs or helps us to achieve practical goals um, with, with uh, uh, nature, nature conservation. Um, so these, these normative proposals um, to uh, approaches to define biodiversity um, have some similarity to discussions um, of the concept of health um, and the philosophy of medicine. Um, and in the sense that they um, incorporate descriptive and normative um, elements that might also be labeled um, hybrid approaches um, in this respect. Um, but yeah, there, there is also, I'm aware of just one um, approach that also defines biodiversity um, as a thick concept in which this descriptive um, and normative element are more um, intricately intertwined um, and cannot be separated, um, but I don't think that it is a, uh, a very prominent position in the literature. So if the analogy to the concept of health uh, holds um, and there are normative and hybrid approaches to the concept, there must also be counterparts to a naturalistic conception. Um, and the prime example for this would be James McLaurin and Kim Sterelny, who have sought to defend the idea that biodiversity is a scientifically useful concept um, by emphasizing that, re that it represents a causally salient or relevant property of natural systems. So they see species richness as a reasonably good or purpose measure of biodiversity that must be further specified or supplemented in specific context, either by consideration of functional diversity in the context of community ecology, for instance. Okay, um, and lastly, uh, so I want to, to point out that there is also, um, there are also problems um, with uh, conceptual uncertainty with respect to biodiversity. So I want to distinguish here two levels. Um, the low level uncertainty concerns the taxonomic categories on which biodiversity measurements are based. Um, and of course I do not know, I, I know that I don't have to tell you guys about this problem given the biodiversity project here, but I just mention it briefly for the sake of uh, completeness. Um, and the high level uncertainty concerning the relative importance of different dimensions of biodiversity. So of course the, the low level uncertainty um, concerns uh, the problem that insofar as there is no consensus um, on the definition of the species concept, this will translate into a similar ambiguity in the concept of measurement of biodiversity. And of course this is problematic because the choice of a taxonomic classification system may be directly linked um, to the uh, outcome and thus effectiveness, effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of conservation policies. 
So if the wrong classification is chosen, we might risk the, we run the risk of potentially excluding valuable or endangered units from conservation priorities, subjecting them to extinction in the worst case. And furthermore, as Gaston has pointed out, a similar problem reappears at the ecosystem level when defining discrete countable units out of essentially continuous phenomena likewise requires some arbitrary rules um, and conventions on how to break up <coughs> naturally occurring um, and continuous ecosystems into biome types or other categories. Um, so there is a different form uh, of uh, conceptual uncertainty um, at the higher level um, and this concerns the selection of the relevant aspect or dimension of biodiversity. So we have seen, it, it has been recognized um, somewhat from the beginning that biodiversity is a multi-dimensional uh, multi concept as it encompasses several dimensions and facets of variability, so genetic diversity, phylogenetic, taxonomic or functional diversity, um, which I think are just about the most commonly discussed but by no means exhaustive. Um, and the differences among these dimensions can also be very consequential, not only for understanding community dynamics, but also for the success or failure of conservation programs. So, for example, an area um, that is high uh, on taxonomic diversity um, in measured as species richness may result in high biodiversity scores for a site, even though the elements there are phylogenetically very similar or functionally poorly differentiated. Uh, and therefore maybe not a uh, prime conservation priority from an ecological perspective. So this raises of course the question what exactly the relevant weight, uh, uh, the relative weight of these different dimensions of biodiversity is supposed to be, um, whether they are all equally relevant um, in different contexts um, and how prioritization decisions um, between them should be made. Okay, so all in all, um, to, to sum it up, it seems pretty bad. So we have no clear definition. Um, we have fundamental philosophical disagreement about the nature of the concept. Although, to be fair, we probably would have philosophical disagreement anyway. And we have <laughs> conceptual uncertainty at several levels and also um, the situation of epistemic risk that in conservation context but also really to translate in eth into ethical risk. So this is probably the reason why Carlos Santana and Jack Justice and others have recently argued for eliminating the concept of biodiversity altogether on the grounds that well, conservation biology would be better off without it. So for Santana, biodiversity neither gives us a coherent and comparable measure of a unitary natural property, nor does it, or species richness for that matter, always track environmental or biological value. Um, and Jack Justice has wonderfully put it in his recent book, despite our different backgrounds, sometimes we have to come together and recognize that a creature, by which of course he means the concept of biodiversity, is a monster and eliminate it. <laughs> which I think is, is a nice phrasing for a philosopher of ecology. So, uh, after describing um, this, this, this problem situation, um, for the rest of this talk, I want to pick out a particular issue um, and address the question further of what I have called this high level um, conceptual uncertainty. So it seems to me that, that one fundamental question for a philosophical understanding of the biodiversity concept um, concerns this relation um, of its many different dimensions and facets to each other and to the general concept. So, the, to put the question very succinctly, is biodiversity a single natural property that stands in explanatory relations in ecology and that is multidimensional, just in the sense that there is a plurality of different indicators for it? Or are the dimensions of biodiversity really independent from each other and the term biodiversity is merely a label that is put on maybe superficially similar, but essentially disparate dimensions um, of natural systems. So in the following, I want to begin answering this question. Um, I have two hypotheses. So first, there are good reasons um, to further explore the multidimensional conception. So that is, uh, the idea that biodiversity is a uni unitary concept um, representing a particular property of natural systems, but one that can be observed in multiple different ways. 
Um, and of course, there is also a metaphysical question to that. Uh, I have not included that into the, into the talk today, but maybe in the, in the discussion session we can go a little bit further into that. So of course, the, the question would be, well, if this is the case, then what kind of kind is biodiversity? So homeostatic property cluster comes to mind, multiple realizability comes to mind, and questions like that. Um, and the second, um, the second hypothesis is, well, if you think of it, there are many multidimensional concepts in ecology. Um, and I think so the most prominent one, and also the one that has received a lot of philosophical attention, is the concept of stability, um, which likewise um, covers dimensions of resilience, resistance, and tolerance. So um, the idea here is that since this multifacetedness um, seems to be common among theoretical concepts in ecology, maybe there would also be an opportunity for a different approach of analyzing these concepts apart from, well, eliminate them. Um, so, okay. So, um, I will start with, with a, a discussion of this multidimensional biodiversity um, and the role that it potentially plays in explanation. Um, this, there was an argument recently brought forward by Birch, Brown and Archer, to which Carlos Santana then um, skeptically responded, so I will kind of revisit this debate. Um, then in the third section, which is, is specifically <coughs> marked as work in progress, um, I will have a look at how multidimensional constructs generally um, and of biodiversity in particular are used in structural equation models um, in ecology. Um, and then in the last section I also want to uh, critically say a few words about um, the question of whether biodiversity um, should correspond to biological or environmental value. Um, and the conclusion is of course just the conclusion. So we have seen that uh, very early on this biodiversity was interpreted as a multidimensional concept in the sense that uh, it was recognized that it is present at many levels of organization, um, but also that specific types or kinds of biodiversity were added into the research. So genetic diversity was, was there from the beginning, but later on um, there was the recognition that the evolutionary relatedness might also be um, relevant or that the functional differentiation of species might also be relevant. So it seems that just further layers um, to the concept um, were getting added. So and although species richness may be a suitable overall purpose measure for several reasons, um, it is also clear that for most um, species richness is taken to be a, a surrogate or proxy for general biodiversity, but not necessarily as an exhaustive characterization of the total meaning of the concept. Um, so, the, a, a, the, 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 the multidimensional um, biodiversity concept um, has, so I'm, I'm sorry, I start again. So the um, distinction, so there are the several further dimensions of biodiversity that are distinguished, uh, but uh, a point that is frequently uh, made by Santana is that in empirical studies um, uh, on biodiversity and its relation to ecosystem functions, um, it is typically only one such dimension um, that is researched, so uh, most commonly species richness or taxonomic diversity. Um, so a, a cornerstone um, of research where the concept of biodiversity is supposed to pay, play some explanatory role um, is the relation between biodiversity and ecosystem functions. Um, so in, in this biodiversity ecosystem function research there is also some consensus that biodiversity and ecosystem functions are positively related. So at least the, the Cardinale et al. Uh, review that was, was published in, in 2012 um, states several um, consensus statements on this debate and one of which <coughs> is that there is mounting evidence that biodiversity increases the stability of ecosystem functions through time and furthermore they state that meta-analysis published since 2000, 2005 have shown that as a general rule reductions in the number of genes, species and functional groups of organisms reduce the efficiency by which whole communities capture biologically essential resources nutrients, water, light, prey, and convert those resources into biomass. Uh, this consistency indicates that there are... Can I ask just a question of precision? 
What do you mean exactly by stability of ecosystem? Because it says biodiversity increased the ecosystem stability. What, what does it mean? Uh, I think in this case they do not really mean the stability of ecosystem, but the stability of ecosystem functions through time. So the provision um, of basic um, ecosystem functions slash services. Uh, so I, I think in this, and I'm not 100% uh, sure, but I think in this the functions that they look at um, is primary productivity, um, nutrient cycling, um, and uh, what is it in English? So the um, uh, breaking up of uh, of materials. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I would have to look at the paper. Um, so, and they also state that, um, uh, that this this meta analysis um, have shown that as a general rule, reductions in the number of genes, species, and functional groups of organisms reduce the efficiency by which whole communities capture biologically essential resources um, and convert those resources into biomass. This consistency indicates that there are general underlying principles that dictate how the organization of communities influences the functioning of ecosystems. So based on these consensus statements, uh, Birch, Brown and Archer have recently tried to argue that it is really the high level, um, that is the multidimensional biodiversity concept itself, that performs an explanatorily relevant function in this respect and therefore should not be eliminated. So they interpret these results in the following way. Emphasizing that their study, uh, their study, so they refer to the, um, to the quote before, has compared findings concerning genetic species and functional measures of diversity. They argue that findings support the view that there are general underlying principles that dictate how the organization of communities influences the functioning of ecosystems. In other words, they attempt to argue that it is not just diversity in any given dimension, but also overall heterogeneity that is of ecological importance. Um, so I, I think their idea goes, goes something like this. We have the higher level of biodiversity that comprises several dimensions, so the genetic, the species, and the functional diversity, um, that each are measured in a specific way. Uh, so I've only um, included one measure here, uh, but in, in principle, they are, they are measured in a different way. Um, and their claim is that this higher level concept allows a level of explanation that would not be achievable by any one of these dimensions in isolation. So, and if this is true, this would be, um, at least in their interpretation, an, a strong argument for the multidimensional conception of biodiversity, because if it can be shown that operationally replacing the concept by any one dimension will fall short, of capturing ecologically important processes, well, there's a good reason to keep the high-level concept of biodiversity then. Um, so this would be very nice, of course, but I think, unfortunately, the Birch, Brown, and Archer do not really provide um, a good argument for this. So confronted with the problem that the individual dimensions of biodiversity do not tightly correlate with each other, and for this reason might raise suspicion that they really collectively form a causally relevant property. They argue, they, they weaken the claim somewhat and argue that the pluralist or multidimensionalist view does not depend on the dimensions of di by, uh, diversity correlating with one another. Rather, they contend that a higher level concept might be useful because it summarizes the interaction of many underlying mediating variables whose relationships would otherwise be too complex to capture easily. Um, but of, of course, this, this notion that the higher level concept merely summarizes the interaction of underlying mediating variables um, is, um, is, somewhat, is somewhat weak. So this would, this would fall back on the position that well, biodiversity is a label that we attach to essentially different dimensions um, of, of natural systems. So, um, and I think this is exactly the point that eliminativists like Carlos Santana then um, would make, who of course disagree with this position. So what he would point out is that already the formulation of the central hypothesis of biodiversity ecosystem function research, which utilizes this higher level concept, um, biodiversity and ecosystem function, so both of these concepts actually um, we have to break them down um, to make them operational in experimental research. So 
Typically in empirical studies, biodiversity will be operationalized as species richness and ecosystem function as primary reproduction, nutrient cycling, um, or others. And this, of course, leaves the role of the multidimensional higher level concept to be somewhat insubstantial. What this research really shows, according to Santana, is the importance of species richness or of taxonomic diversity, but not the relevance of multidimensional biodiversity overall. Um, so, he, also, he then also claims that well, even if we investigate multi, multiple dimensions of biodiversity, um, so like, like in the case before where we have the genetic, the species, um, and the functional diversity, he claims that well, if, if these dimensions are collectively relevant to, this, uh, to the ecosystem processes, they will do so through each through different um, mechanisms um, and not through one single mechanism of overall biodiversity. Um, so for him, um, in, in, in his interpretation, when we operationalize biodiversity as species richness uh, or, or measure it through an index, what we really do is that we break down biodiversity into distinct components research the causal relevance of these distinct components and then you know put the biodiversity label on for the for the headline of the paper but as a matter of fact it is it is very insubstantial so this is the claim um, yeah to, to the extent that other dimensions of biodiversity play a role in explaining productivity so others than, than species richness they will do so through independent causal factors, not through some unitary mechanism involving all the different dimensions of biodiversity. Um, and, and so for him, this is, this is a very strong argument because uh, these different dimensions of biodiversity <coughs> also refer to different elements. Um, and it is therefore very hard to understand how a unitary mechanism um, could relate these very different kinds of elements um, in a way that provides a substantial concept of overall heterogeneity, um, as, as Birch, Brown, and Archer claim. So as they stand, I think these arguments are very compelling. Um, the understanding that we achieve in biodiversity ecosystem function research is an understanding mostly um, of a single dimension of biodiversity, depending on the study design. Uh, but Generally, we are used to treat um, species richness as the, the prime um, surrogate or, or proxy or operationalization or measure for biodiversity. Um, although the extent to which this is plausible is of course also subject to, um, to debate. So, but, um, so it, it might, might look uh, pretty, pretty bad for this multidimensional um, biodiversity thing. So, uh, I thought, well, maybe, maybe there is, maybe at least something more can be said to it. So, um, so, so one thing is that it, of course, uh, it may not be possible to devise um, a biodiversity construct that encompasses all biodiversity dimensions. We can cover at least some. So this is also one of Santana's criticism, saying that, well, if um, multidimensional approaches were taken, they usually they focus on taxonomic diversity and functional diversity, but not on all of the biodiversity dimensions. Um, but granted, but of course we could always say, well, we want to explore a weaker notion of multidimensional biodiversity and just ex you know, be content with um, explaining the joint effect of three dimensions. Um, so we do not really have to commit to the claim that multidimensional biodiversity makes sense only if all of its dimensions are covered simultaneously all the time. Um, so one, one example that, he, uh, that Santana himself gives in the discussion is that research on the diversity productivity relationship does sometimes appeal to more than, than one dimension. So, um, one um, explanatory hypothesis for this relation or one mechanism this approach uh, that is suggested for this uh, relation is uh, niche differentiation or complementarity. Um, so the idea that, uh, that different species that belong to different functional groups will more effectively um, partition the available resource space uh, and thereby increase, uh, increase ecosystem function. Um, and it seems 
seems plausible to claim that well, this this is a a, uh, a proposed mechanism um, that makes use of taxonomic and functional diversity. So, although this is far short from really the, the grand claim of multidimensional biodiversity, this would still um, at least be one example. Um, where we can um, productively incorporate several dimensions of biodiversity um, also in, into an explanatory scheme. Um, also, we could say that Santana treats this multidimensionality as an all or nothing concept, so either we achieve a full integration or the concept of biodiversity um, should be eliminated, which might of course be um, um, exaggerated. Um, and yes, and we can interpret this multidimensionality criteria in just weaker. Um, yeah. So, uh, in the following section, then um, I want to have a look um, at current proposals um, to do multidimensional biodiversity research and then um, begin to evaluate um, the extent to which they uh, might help us also in the, in the philosophical understanding of, of this idea that this is a a unitary property or a thing, but with multiple facets or dimensions. So, as I already said, many theoretical constructs um, are multidimensional and multifaceted. The diversity stability hypothesis is a case in point where stability also was um, in, is uh, interpreted as consisting of several different ideas. Um, and of course, there is also this long philosophical controversy uh, about the vagueness of the concept um, and its correct understanding. Um, so I, I think that, that maybe um, this, this um, just warrants a different philosophical approach um, to, um, to understanding um, and analyzing these concepts. So uh, one suggestion um, that was put forth by, by ecologists, I don't know, for, since some, some years, now um, is to use the structural equation modeling um, because this would provide a convenient way of linking theoretical concepts um, or what are uh, in the models interpreted as latent variables to observable or manifest variables. Um, so in this case um, the, var the variable um, in uh, in, the, in the circle um, is <coughs> interpreted as, as a theoretical construct um, and the variables in the squares are indicators, so observable, measurable indicators um, and it is assumed um, or the, the theoretical construct is explained um, as having a causal effect um, on the observable um, variables. So. Um, Naim and, and, and colleagues in the paper from 2016, uh, what they suggested was um, that this general approach um, of modeling causal interactions um, in, in complex systems um, could be used um, to capture multi-dimensional biodiversity um, in, in research approaches. So uh, for, for experimental and, and observational studies. So, um, their, their paper starts with a clear statement of this multidimensional conception of biodiversity, um, so we know that now, um, but they also uh, really uh, seem to think or uh, point out um, that to them biodiversity is still um, a unitary property. So what they state is that biodiversity has its lowest non-zero value when an ecosystem contains a single recently evolved species consisting of one genetically homogeneous population that is small in its geographical extent and narrow in its range of habitats, and it has its highest value when there are many species that represent a broad taxonomic range, with some species recently evolved, others ancient, and all made uh, up of many genetically heterogeneous populations that, furthermore, exhibit interactions within and among other populations across the landscape through emigration and immigration, and furthermore, describe a complex interaction network with many lots and many species per lot. So, this is one huge list of criteria to include, um, and it is of course not at all obvious how, how such a uh, concept could be made practical, um, but still they think this is reflective of the theoretical meaning of the concept, so of the, of the uh, conceptual course, so to speak. Um, 
So if we if we limit it to just three dimensions for the sake of understanding, um, so it seems what what they have in mind would be um, to view biodiversity as something like a hyperdimensional space in which each dimension represents one element of of life of life's diversity. Um, and then we can also locate the, the lowest value um, and the highest value, so assuming that this refers to a more or less closed um, system. Uh, the idea, this idea is of course not unproblematic because it assumes that these biodiversity, these dimensions um, are orthogonal to each other and it is not really clear that they are, but yeah, I think this is an ambiguity that is, that is in the paper themselves. Um, yeah. So it's not clear that they are obviously correlated, so they cannot be orthogonal. Yeah. So I don't understand. You, you should put that objection much stronger. Yeah, I, I, I will next time. <laughs> 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 um, so, so of course, this this hyper volume idea is I don't know. It, it may be it may be it may give an intuitive uh, idea, but it is it is of course problematic. Um, so, what, but what they claim is um, that these usual studies that have focused on a single dimension um, of biodiversity um, uh, so lead, uh, come to show different things um, than studies which are done in a multidimensional framework. So, multidimensional frameworks, uh, they claim, can provide greater insight into the mechanisms underpinning biodiversity's influence on ecosystem properties than unidimensional studies. So and what, what they then present is um, a general framework to this, to this respect. So the, the case study they discuss um, is, is the following. So, so they ask uh, to what extent uh, anthropogenic drivers lead to biodiversity change, lead to a change in ecosystem function. Um, the anthropogenic driver is increased deer herbivory, um, which is thought to result um, of the removal of apex predators um, from like wolves from ecosystems who uh, up to now serve as population control. Biodiversity um, is uh, interpreted as taxonomic, functional and phytogenetic diversity um, and ecosystem function as uh, total um, vegetation cover. So the, uh, the, the general framework um, would then for, for this multidimensional biodiversity would then look like this. Um, the number of taxa, so species richness, um, is considered to be a correlate of the biodiversity dimensions, not the biodiversity dimension itself. Um, every biodiversity dimension um, is measured by different indices, so Shannon, Simpson, or whatever. Um, and we have basically lines, uh, so arrows, double-headed arrows represent core variation, um, and single-headed arrows represent causal paths. Uh, and, and in, in principle, this, this could be extended indefinitely. So um, they discussed the framework with four biodiversity dimensions, but I skipped the fourth to, to put the picture on the. Uh, but, but in principle, of course, it is extendable. Um, so, and what, what they claim um, that they can show based on this framework um, is that the steer herbivory um, changes the relative weight um, of the individual dimensions. So, in systems where there is no protection for steer herbivory, <coughs> Functional diversity is the dimension that has the strongest influence on ecosystem function, um, and in the protected blocks, taxonomic diversity has the strongest influence. So, what they claim to, to be able to show is that the structure of the relationship between dimensions of biodiversity and ecosystem function is qualitatively different between treatments. So, uh, herbivory may change the relationship among dimensions of biodiversity. Um, and uh, ecosystem functions uh, uh, or services. Um, so in this sense, um, one could argue that multidimensional biodiversity studies, or so the argument goes, can reveal a deeper understanding of the underlying complexity of ecological processes and relationships and potentially thereby support more adequate conservation or restoration practices. Uh, but it can also reveal how biodiversity um, as a multidimensional uh, construct is explanatorily relevant. Yeah, so I cannot go into a full discussion of the details of the approach uh, here, um, but 
well, there are at least some open questions for now. Um, I've already mentioned the the issue of this idea um, that the that this is a multi-dimensional space when the dimensions obviously co-vary and are supposed to co-vary to make the um, the, the the causal model work. Um, but there's also the, the issue um, that this thing is incredibly complex um, and even just covering the three biodiversity dimensions um, requires a lot of paths to be analyzed um, and a large amount of data. Um, and there's also the, the thing that uh, in this framework species richness plays um, a special role um, as universal covariate of every um, biodiversity dimension which you know, seems to point or to, to suggest that, well, biodiversity is really essentially to some extent species richness um, and we achieve contextual sensitivity but then further adding specific biodiversity dimensions. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with such a position, but, but this is of course what McLaurin and Sereni have argued before um, and so it is not clear what this, what this framework um, adds to an understanding that we um, already had basically. So, yeah, this, this is still an open question for me. Um, but on the other hand, I think that, uh, well, uh, it, it might also su suggest that generally for philosophy, um, the approach to analyzing multifaceted concepts, not only in ecology, but also in the social sciences or in ecology, um, in terms of either cluster of properties or observable correlations, uh, might just be unsuitable for the particular function and work that these concepts do um, in particular explanations. So um, interpreting these concepts as theoretical constructs that are interpreted as causes of observable variables and connected through multiple pathways um, may work as a philosophical approach to, to better understand how these concepts work um, in specific fields. So, uh, yes, but this, this would have to be further explored. Um, and based on this, there, there would at least be some preliminary responses to Santana, so we can, we can reasonably claim that the multidimensional biodiversity concept is valuable in the sense that um, explicit multidimensional studies increase our understanding generally of its relevance um, and of the uh, relative importance of its dimensions to um, certain ecosystem processes. Um, but we could also claim that Santana interprets these operationalizations of biodiversity um, really in a, in a too strong a way as, as literal eliminations or reductions of the concept um, that does not seem plausible just from a meta-theoretical perspective because these um, operationalizations do not really exhaust the meaning of the concept but only specify a particular, a particular aspect of its use for a particular purpose. So um, I guess that this, I, I guess that, that at least we could raise some criticism of how he uses this understanding of operationalization to support this strong eliminativist um, conclusion. Okay, um, I have five more minutes, right? Sure. Um, so just uh, quickly, um, if, so if we can um, substantiate um, this, this multidimensionalist conception, um, I think there would also be some consequences for, uh, for normativity and, and conservation. So there are many, many desiderata for, for the concept of biodiversity. It should be measurable. We want it to be, in some sense, a causally salient property um, in order to be able to explain um, what role uh, reductions in biodiversity um, would have for certain ecosystem functions but also very often it is interpreted um, or it is demanded that, it's, that it serves as a means of prioritization in conservation um, in the sense that it directly denotes or represents biological or environmental value um, which is oftentimes also interpreted as the claim that the biodiversity concept is value laden or normative. Um, so there are different, different views um, that, that, that spell out this, this uh, value-ladenness. So there's this idea that biodiversity is intrinsically valuable and therefore the concept is. There is this other idea um, that well, it serves as an agenda, it has an agenda setting function um, and because of that it has um, normative um, content. There's a, the idea that it is a metaphor um, and also lastly the idea that there are positive connotations 
and associations with cultural and social diversity um, confer normative uh, or valued in non normative meaning or valued in this on the concept. Um, however, I, I think that none of these are really good arguments or claims um, to, to that effect. So the, the last two, I think, they generally um, confuse uh, the difference between the concept um, and the term with which we refer to the concept. So the term biodiversity might have properties that the concept of biodiversity does not. Um, and these um, metaphorical meaning um, or positive connotations, they may apply to the label or to the word by which we refer to the concept, but they are insubstantial in really claiming um, that the, the concept biodiversity itself is normative. Um, and for the first two, I also think that uh, some of these proposals um, just conflate the normativity of the concept with the evaluative significance of the things that are picked out by it. So um, objects, there are a variety of objects that are important for human interests but are not defined in terms of these interests. So to borrow the example from James McLaurin, um, climate um, is uh, a central concept um, in, in, in current climate science, there might also be the sense in which in which we can say that it is a um, an agenda. It has an agenda setting function, and it is also crucial for human existence. But it is ultimately not defined um, in terms of these interests. So very much like the gold, uh, like gold um, as the substance with atomic number seventy nine, um, is not normative and is not uh, defined in terms of human interests, um, despite obviously being very valuable um, in, in certain human societies. So to, to get a clearer idea on this, uh, on this issue, I suggest to, to define um, normativity of a concept as a normative statement as part of its definitional clause, um, which is here represented as the, um, uh, uh, as the odd operator um, in, in, in the ontic logic. Um, and furthermore, that omitting this normative element will lead to a misidentification or an adequate characterization um, of the target phenomenon. So, an, an example from the social sciences that I borrow from, from Julian Reis is um, the unemployment rate, which is defined as the number of currently unemployed individuals uh, over the total size of the labor force. Um, and here, normativity is clear because we know that we cannot find the number total size of the labor force um, by researching empirically researching society. Um, so the total labor force is indetermined by empirical criteria. Um, defining this concept requires a decision um, that we have to make and that arguably would have to be based on epistemic and non-epistemic values because this also implies um, a value judgment about the permissibility of counting certain people to the labor force. Um, and this, and, and of course, th this is a question that, that, that has to be made. So, where is the cutoff? Um, who should be counted to the labor force? Um, and we can also see that omitting the normative element um, in determining the concept would lead to an inadequate measure. So, of course, we, we could say that, well, we do not count the total uh, size of the labor force, but just the total population. So not to having to make that decision, but of course that would lead to a good measure um, because uh, the, the total size of the labor force <coughs> is a much more clear um, idea of, of, what we, of what we want with this measure. Um, so, so, so given this, this, this criterion that omitting the normative component um, in the definition leads to a misidentification uh, and adequate characterization, so there are some uh, uh, concepts in, in the social sciences and, and psychology that I think clearly satisfy this criterion, um, but I would argue that the concept of biodiversity um, is in this respect uh, very much unlike um, the concept of unemployment. Um, so the, the broad notion of variety of biotic entities at structural, taxonomic and functional levels is just not underdetermined um, if we do not include the clause that these entities merit protection. Um, and furthermore, doing, also explicitly including this normative criterion, might also be problematic um, because it makes it uh, actually harder to ask empirically in which context, which aspects of biodiversity might turn out to be variable for, for whatever reasons. So what I suggest basically um, is 
that, there are, that we can accept a weaker form of normativism. So in the sense there is no support for normativism when really defining the concept, but this is very different from the claim that raw values uh, and norms cannot play a role in operationalizations of biodiversity in conservation practice. Um, but I would urge um, to distinguish um, these two different enterprises um, on, on the grounds that despite that we are all um, aware that values can play various roles in various aspects of scientific research, we should still be precise at exactly where um, they come in um, in order to assess the um, legi legitimacy. So, um, and, I, and I think that these, these multidimensional um, and pluralist conception might also be helpful in this respect to support this point. Um, because it does not um, lock us too much um, into this position that we have to find a definition that is responsive um, to certain normative or evaluative considerations. So, yes. I am a, very much over time, so I've, uh, this, this was a two the force for the last slides. Um, I leave you with a picture of, of Bielefeld's Teutoburg Forest, um, which is so, so basically one of the, the only um, interesting things that you can find there. Um, <laughs> thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, breaks are yeah. short. Is there a break?
great. Uh, thank you. I, is there any questions? I'm keeping an eye on YouTube if something comes in. We have had a few people watching. Uh, really? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I think in the first part of your talk, uh, you, you briefly asked the question, like, what kind of kind is biodiversity, given this multidimensionality of it? And, and I think you referred to the possibility of trying to understand it in terms of homeostatic property clusters or multiple realizability. So I just, I just wanted to hear a little bit more uh, on, on this very topic. Yeah. Um, I'm very undecided on that. So I don't know. It, it, it seems to me that this idea um, that biodiversity in this sense might be homeostatic property cluster, that's, that's kind of the go-to solution. The, the first thing that comes to mind, oh well, um, if, if we have this you know, kind of seeming incoherence, but still this intuitive idea that there is uh, something underlying. But I, I think that, so this has been proposed in the literature um, and also been criticized on the grounds that it is just not clear what the underlying mechanism would be. Um, who serves um, this, uh, the, you know, keeps them homeostatic. Um, and as long as there is no um, explanation for that, um, I think it's that, that would not be feasible. Um, so the question is, of course, what, what could be such a mechanism? Um, and I don't know, um, the, only, the only suggestion that I came across uh, would be to claim, well, natural selection. Um, but natural selection does not act on uh, all of the entities that the specific biodiversity dimensions refer to. So we could plausibly claim that for taxonomic diversity um, and for genetic diversity, but um, it is probably already very hard um, to um, substantiate the idea for functional categories. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, this, maybe this, this, this deserves further exploration, but there are some reasons initially to, to doubt it. Um, and when it comes to this multiple realizability idea, um, I think, so this is a problem for me, because um, this seems very intuitive um, and very easily comprehensible, um, but so I'm, I'm just exploring the topic, but from, from what I understand how this argument is really used specifically in the philosophy of mind, it is not at all clear that it may just be, you know, picked up and translated to, to the concept of biodiversity in its different dimensions. Um, so, I don't know, this would have to involve um, an argument that, that biodiversity, so the, the, the general biodiversity concept has a specific function um, that is realized by its different um, uh, by its different dimensions and yeah I, I do not really I do not really see how this how this works o other than um, that this metaphor of high level and lower level and diff, um, seems appealing I think yeah there's there's not really a substance but there, there may be so I'm, I'm currently I'm trying to figure it out um, a third possibility that I was also thinking about that is very very different um, actually comes from Anna Alexandrova's book um, on the philosophy of well-being, where she also discusses, but more on a, on a from a philosophy of language perspective, how we can account for the fact that well-being um, is a multifaceted concept. concept. And she, she, mentioned, she mentions three possibilities. Um, so one, one of them is that it is contextual, which is not very interesting in this, in, in, in this context, but, but one other possibility that she mentions is differential realization, um, which is an idea that apparently um, has, has been discussed um, in the field of epistemology. Um, and the, I think the idea is that, uh, so the concept of knowledge um, has stable semantic meaning but what makes um, knowledge assertions true in particular instances might vary. So stable semantic meaning, but different truth makers in different contexts. Um, and this could work for the biodiversity concept as well. So we might say, well, there is the stable um, semantic meaning, um, 
the, the theoretical concept uh, is variability at multiple levels of organization. Um, but what makes um, yeah, biodiversity claims true um, in different contexts are different things. Um, this, that could be a possibility. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not very far yet. Um, but I, yeah, I, so I, I think one would have to give an answer um, if one to. So I think this is also an instance where um, metaphysics can't be avoided. Um, there, there would have to be some explanation. Um, and of course, a, a further thing would also be um, to. So this this was discussed by by James McLaurin in the paper um, to even have a more. Um, no, I, I don't want to call it deflationary, but, but this Magnus theory of natural kinds, um, which ties um, kind membership more um, explicitly to pragmatic usefulness um, in ex for explanatory purposes. Um, so of, of course, if one if one subscribes to such a um, to such a view of natural kinds, then then it may be yeah then such an argument might also go through, um, but. But still, I I would like to have a more substantial concept um, of of kind. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I have many. So you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. This was really interesting, and I'm particularly interesting and in, in, uh, interested in what you said in the last five minutes or so. Yes. Which were more like you took more positions. Uh, um, and um, I'm at the same time attracted and also a bit puzzled by uh, what you said about uh, this like, uh, trying not to conceive it as a normative uh, or, or like avoid the normativistic reading of the concept. Um, and you said there, which I think is a good point, that there's a difference between the concept and the word. Uh, while the word has these aspects, it doesn't have to be so that the concept is... But, I mean, there is some... Like, you might want that. Um, like, maybe in science we need a good concept of, 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 of biodiversity, and, and we might indeed do need one that is um, not depending on uh, on social factors uh, or on political factors, um, and then like this should be like the word that we invent for it. We might just use the word bi about biodiversity anyway. Um, shouldn't be polluted by the the political discussions that are associated to the word that we have now. But this is like something that we create. We still, I mean, you want it to be like that. You want to find this concept that does this non-normative, that is this non-normative thing. It doesn't have to correspond to the concept as we are using it right now, right? It's, uh, it, it seems like a, a goal of sort of meta-science, uh, a goal of where science has to has to go towards, uh, you know, like we want to find a concept that is like almost a natural kind um, that would then not correspond, not have the dirty <laughs> associations uh, with politics or so, it's more social things. Um, so that seems like not something so much about uh, the, the, the like description or explanation of what happens in scientific communities now, but more like how you want the concept to be used in further scientific development. Is that correct? That would be the first part. Um, and if it's not, if you want also to say about how something about how the concept is used right now, then I don't think it makes much sense. Maybe I'm too pragmatist. Uh, to, to separate the word from the concept. I mean, this is almost platonistic and there is nothing beyond the word. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the, you know um, the, the word is, is what we are talking, we are 
attracted to biodiversity as it is used by scientists, which is a word, uh, and we can translate that to other languages. Um, but it's always related to, to the same sort of usages, which are always linguistic. We never go outside of language for that purpose. Uh, um, uh, and we can, of course, try to develop better words, which would then reflect another concept or something like that. Uh, we would want to change the meaning of our words, which is fine. Uh, but that's always an attempt to revision uh, the, the, cur the current practices are just what they are, uh, in my opinion. They, they, they should not it, it's very hard to like distinguish word from concept. Uh, but I mean, that's my opinion. I mean, but, but, I'm a very pragmatist. But these are you're a pragmatist. They are you're a pragmatist. They are not. Yeah, no, no, no. But that, I, that, that's why I'm interested. So I want to see where we are misunderstanding each other, or what are your sort of philosophy of language uh, positions come from. So, um, so to clearly explain um, the difference. Of, so my philosophy of language intuitions come very much from Carnap. Okay. Um, so I, I would have an explication approach back in mind. So I did not provide an explication of biodiversity, but this would be like the, the, the general um, framework within which I am thinking. Um, and I consider myself to be um, very, um, very progressive Canapian in the sense that I have no problem with excluding <laughs> with including an evaluative component um, into an explication of a concept if there are good reasons to do so because we might claim that it has actual epistemological consequences if we don't mm -hmm. um, and so, so this was the it is true to some extent. Um, this is this seems very old school because it assumes that um, we can have the value theory thing, um, and only in certain situations um, we have to accept that value influences come in. Um, it is not meant really in that way, but but rather um, it seems to me that if if you look at different concepts, um, there are different arguments um, for different concepts um, of why and exactly where um, a normative or evaluative component um, really figures in to defining the object of study um, or how values play a role in assessing to what extent a concept is adequate. Um, so, uh, as, an, as an example, there's Elizabeth Anderson's discussion about the concept of intelligence um, where, where she makes the claim that um, there is, it is fundamentally impossible um, to arrive um, at the definition of this concept without an idea of certain problem solving capacities that we would deem valuable. Um, or a similar argument was, was recently made on, on the attempt to provide a value free theory um, of, of rational addiction um, in, in economics in which they also claimed, well, the, the attempt um, to give an explication in completely value-free terms somehow misses the target phenomenon that you were initially um, caring about and trying to find out. Um, so, and given these, these claims and the fact that um, biodiversity is often um, portrayed or labeled as a normative concept, but without ever giving a really clear um, explanation of why, exactly where and how, how it works, I thought just to test the claim. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it really normative? Um, so, and, and, and based on, on this claim, I came to the conclusion, well, no, as a matter of fact, I think we can, uh, we can have uh, a definition or an, an explication or of the concept without having to introduce um, these normative elements and we would not have made um, our epistemological situation any worse. So we would still be concerned with the phenomenon that we want to talk about. Um, but of course that this is different from the claim that the concept can be made practical in conservation contexts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. And, uh, and I think one, one underlying issue is also that I, that I think sometimes that it is that operationalizations and operational definitions 
um, are interpreted as really definitions, general definitions of um, a concept, um, such that they um, e exhaust uh, the meaning of the concept. Um, and I also think um, that it is necessary um, to keep these um, two uh, dimensions better apart. So yeah, I'm not really in, uh, the, how it is actually used. Um, this, this, this may be very different from, from what I have reconstructed, but of course I would say, well, I'm not really that interested in how it is actually used, but in a rational reconstruction of the concept, so, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for a very clear talk. And I'm, I have to say that it's been a long time that I'm jealous of someone, so I would really like to work on biodiversity because obviously it's a mess. <laughs> and it's a mess by confused people. Because if, if, if the picture you gave us is reliable, there's like, like the, the question of Peter, you know, that's an obvious question to ask. You know, normative about what anything is normative. And language is normative. It's normative. They dislike political norm. They don't want that in science, but obviously it's a normative concept. The way it's used, the way it's used in explanation, it's not, it's not something like like mass yet, yet. So there, there's a lot of confusion. I, I have a lot of questions about possible confusion, and I need more information, uh, if you don't mind. And you can stop me, the President. Sure. So when, when you're confused about what you measure in the history of science, we know historians wrote complete books about the fact that what you measure is strongly correlated to the evolution of techniques. So like temperature, mass, so we don't know what is mass until we have values. We don't know what is temperature until we have reliable, stable thermometers. Okay, we don't know what is temperature. We can feel heat, but we don't have temperature. It looks like the biodiversity looks like that. It's like, what, what is the history of the index, the techniques of measure? For example, to, to manage to differentiate diversity from heterogeneity, like you said, you know, this, this is not the same thing. This is not the same way to measure, but it seems important in that case because you have this functional aspect, this localization aspect. And I, I would look at the history of measurements to see if there's such a thing as like a direction towards a concept. If not, you should eliminate it. <laughs> so do you see in the literature a, an evolution of the techniques to measure this so-called biodiversity that seems to, to evolve somewhere in the direction or not? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there is. So, um this is a little bit, th think about gene, for example, you know, the genes it took time to stabilize the technique of measurement to have a, a good concept of genes. Now there's more than one, but still, <laughs> there's no 25 now. We are two, three concepts of genes. So it's true the, the, pro the, the, the practice that progressively, we, it's not the theory that changed, it's the practice. So do you see such a history for biodiversity? Mm, right, there, there certainly is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I can, if I can tell you that right now. So, I mean, what, what there is, um, there is um, an, an attempt um, recently to come up with unified measures. So a unified um, attribute measure that um, includes taxonomic, phylogenetic, and, and functional diversity. Um, and I think the so what has evolved um, are the techniques um, of deriving um, uh, 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 deriving a diversity index um, based of on sample data. Um, but uh, so I mean I think these are there are always two different uh, two different aspects to biodiversity measurements because one is um, the the estimation techniques um, and how you arrive um, at the data in the first place. So either by by counts and recounts, or by linear transects of really going into the fields um, and, and counting species or, or certain traps. Um, and there's, there are also uh, now techniques that estimate 
um, vegetation cover based on satellite images um, and of course so there is this history of how data sam uh, collection um, has improved um, and data processing has improved and then there is the other thing of mathematical calculations of different diversity indexes um, but these are so I mean these, these play a role mostly in, in theoretical ecology and in community ecology I think but do they converge all these different measurements now towards uh, something coherent, or are they still? So I think this. I I uh, I don't I don't uh, know really, but the suggestion um, of this uh, universal attribute measure of diversity, so based on Chao Hill numbers, um, I think this is supposed um, to give um, a, a convergent um, unifying measure um, of biodiversity. Um, but I, I, at this point, I cannot, I cannot evaluate it. I just know yeah, that it exists. Because the sign that you are towards the right direction is when it's stabilized. What you measure is relatively stable towards different techniques. So until it's not like that, you know that you don't measure anything. Now I can give you, you know, the quality of universities. You know, the ranking change every year. It's obviously completely useless measure because there's they don't they didn't find the right techniques to have a, a phenomenon that you measure. Temperature, pretty good, pretty good. Thermometer, different thermometer <laughs> goes pretty good. So do you, when you have this addition of different factors to the index, does it increase the stability of measurement for the same ecosystem? Well, I, I don't know. Because if not, the I would say, okay, interesting, but no kind, like you're looking for a kind. You're very optimistic. You want to kind. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I'm not optimistic anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, this so, so this idea, um, like you would have uh, convergent operationalizability, um, this uh, and so have have a robust um, measure. I, I don't think that you can have that with uh, with biodiversity. Okay. Um, so if if there is a, a way of, of still arguing well that the that the concept serves some 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 function or some purpose, um, it is not that. Um, and but I'm I'm not sure. So I may be I may be wrong, but because I really just don't know. But um, I think that uh, also this 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 method of this integrated so measure. I'm just putting across. So technique one, no. Okay. Second one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, I think all the time. So it's very Because I was I was wondering about the temperature case, um, and. It's been a long time since I read the book, but if you look at that history, it's not like the different thermometers converge. Where it's like one became more precise, and it interacts with other theory and so on, and then one becomes dominant. And it's more like it's uh, almost a conventional case, also, but uh, the different substances they use all end up at the same point or anything like that. So I wonder. If with biodiversity you could have a similar process where there's currently they're measuring different things actually, but there's one that works really well for whatever we're doing or is very stable across um, different habitats, right? I don't know. No, but it's, it's similar for temperature. Yeah. So no, no, it, it, it looks like biodiversity because at the beginning they don't know if they they cannot separate pressure from temperature, so the same instrument seems to be. If there's a pressure change or a temperature change, it change. So if you go to see a Toritelli at, uh, you go to the Science Museum of uh, Firenze, you, know, you can see the original instrument and it looks like a barometer. But progressively, oh, okay, there's two things that we think we measure, or three things. Oh, okay, maybe maybe it's one. Okay, let's just isolate this one. Oh, okay, it's stabilized. And, from step to, it's not just a, a linear thing. That, it, there's also a differentiated, the, the phenomena is one phenomena, multidimensional or unidimensional. And they don't see it to theory, they see it to evolution of techniques and stability. 
So it's, it's more similar than you think. It, I think this mess of biodiversity looks like temperature in, uh, in the 16th century. Yeah, so I, I agree with you, but my takeaway is actually the opposite. Like, it is very similar, but in temperature, it also never was the case that they converged. So I don't think that should be the criteria. It's just if you have an interesting measure that outcompetes some of the others in ways that works well for us, uh, then maybe it's that kind of evolution that you could, could use and you see something like that in biodiversity. Like, are there certain measures that Maybe, maybe it's still a mess and they don't converge, but are there certain measures that are really useful for whatever goals we're trying to achieve? Well, well they are, but, but only for um, specific dimensions. So there are good, good indexes for taxonomic diversity. Um, there's this uh, phylogenetic measure um, that was introduced by Faith um, is a good measure for phylogenetic diversity um, and so on. But um, the, the question would of course be if we can integrate um, these different dimensions. Um, and I think this is uh, so. There, I, I just don't. I just don't know. If, if, I, if I understand correctly, what you're uh, interested in is this. Uh, you say this lo logical reconstruction of the concept of biodiversity and whether we can find a, an actual kind. Um, and even if we solve the problem of technology, be it by consensus or be it by technological progress, that we now really, really know what, how to measure uh, species richness really well or genetic diversity very well, which I think we can do. I think genetic diversity is fairly consensualized on. Even with those things, we are not able to, to get to a conceptual definition, uh, an ambiguous conceptual definition, right? That is, is that what you would say? That even in the face of technological consensus, you would not have necessarily conceptual consensus? Well, not, not with respect to the general concept. So, I mean, the, the individual dimensions, this is fine. Um, and an approach um, to um, model the causal pathways, um, or to approximate that, because how, how model fit this is, is an issue on top, this can be done, but at least in principle, model the pathways um, between these dimensions. Um, this, this could also be done, but of course, um, so the, the, the question is if there is still um, a, a valid interpretation of the thing that this um, represents the theoretical, the theoretical biodiversity concept. Um, and there, so, uh, there I think the, um, so th this is just an open question, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have one, so I'm going to, to take my power. Um, I always wondered when reading Santana uh, if, okay, we imagine, let's say, we all agree that biodiversity is uh, worthless, so we should get rid of it and we should stop. But what, so, what should we do? Should we just tell scientists to not write biodiversity in the title of the papers? But how does it actually play out? Like, how, how does the limit the uh, limit uh, look like? No, it's, it's a genuine question. Uh, how, how do <laughs> <laughs> sort of genuine? Uh, how how do we how do we go about it? Yeah, that's the same question that I would um, that I would ask ask him. So, I mean, this this is very so. <laughs> I mean, I understand the, the arguments, and of course, I, I, I think they are very good arguments, um, but at the end, I mean, this, this boils down to just regulating linguistic usage um, to, to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, yes, I also do not, do not see how this is done. Um, one, one could also claim, well, there is still not, not every um, productive scientific concept has to be made um, operational. So, the, the argument um, that this serves, um, I don't know, as, as a label or it organizes specific dimensions that we are interested in, this is a valuable purpose that the concept might serve. Um, it is probably much less than some 
some would have imagined, um, but it's just it's just better than nothing. Um, and so, and in, in this debate, we have this we have this problem generally um, that ecosystem function or biodiversity is just a stand-in for very different dimensions, and we just have to uh, make clear of which particular dimensions we we cover, and we can still then make the argument that well all else being equal or generically biodiversity has an effect on, on ecosystem functions so kind of a, a summary at the high level um, but yeah I'm, so while, while this is always a, a possibility of claiming that well we can keep the concept around because for that reason because it just serves to structure the field um, I, I still I would be yeah. so as I said I, I think I would just be interested in whether we can have um, still more out of it than, than this. Okay. Uh, in the back, no? No. Yeah, no. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah I follow actually to your question. Because you have the same problem in basically every debate about scientific concepts, like species, genes, whatever. There's always the negativists, there's the tourists, there's and now, of course, nothing happens because it's just philosophers talking. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I want to say myself if we do such a paper about natural kinds. Um, so, why do you why do you do it? You say that you think about like your Canadian view how it should be used and so on, and not how they actually use it. Wouldn't it be more useful to investigate how scientists actually use the concept and then go from there rather than do what you and all philosophers do? I mean, I'm not... I've done because he's a philosopher, he's not a sociologist. You know, that's unfair. <laughs> yeah, that's why... That's an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you're using okay. societal money for You can answer. answer. Yeah, but, but I mean, also, I think how I described it is pretty much how it is used uh, by, by scientists. So, Typically, typically you you would have a paper on biodiversity and ecosystem function, or biodiversity and whatever. Um, and if you then you know go go through how, how they describe the methods, um, it's I don't know species richness measured as or some some other some other index and then so the the concepts get um, further specified and further defined. Um, so the, I think that the general idea is pretty much that it serves um, it serves some organizing function. Um, I don't know. I mean, there is there is still the there is of course the discussion whether this is um, legitimate um, to to some extent. So Sarkozy claims that biodiversity is a concept of conservation biology and not of systematics, taxonomy, or ecology. Um, is I, th I think pretty much based on, on this observation that um, it is also used um, to uh, promote um, research um, and to gather to get a, um, interest um, um, on the research by, by using the label biodiversity. Um, and for this reason, he also um, seems to be um, aware that it sh just should be restricted to its use uh, to its, uh, in, in conservation biology for that, for that reason. Um, and there may be something to it, so the, the fact that uses of the concept proliferated um, certainly almost just, it would be it would be weird if it had nothing to do with the uh, uh, with the broad public attention um, of the concept. Um, but still, this might be the sociological reason why it got used so much. But now that it is there um, and that it has been used for quite some time, one could say, well, in the meantime, it also has taken on other functions. So. rather than gaining attention. And it has actually changed the actual scientific practice of, of disciplines that are not conservation biology, right? Uh, I think that's already worth enough investigating what's happening in that continent, instead of saying that we should not use it, I think. Um, I don't know. Peter? Yeah, uh, so, so, so I'm a complete outsider, I'm not, I don't work in of biology at all, so uh, my, my question may be quite stupid. Um, but um, 
uh, still about this normative uh, aspect of the concept that seems to be there. Um, so while I think it's interesting to look for a concept that is not does not have this content, uh, and it might maybe possible even for biodiversity. What seems to me intuitively, but maybe I'm more aware of the like general public usage of the word than uh, the, the scientific usage of the word. But it seems to me that, um, like, suppose if I think of comparing it to temperature and so on, suppose that indeed there were, was some possibility to have a stable measure and um, then it, it going towards a consensus, maybe some techniques to best measure it and so on, like temperature. Um, and then, just like a hypothetical situation, we find that some ecosystem that uh, has, according to this measure, uh, should be counted as a very high bio, uh, biodiverse uh, environment, um, has some awful consequences. Uh, like just uh, the, the way the, 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 the system is, is, is clearly perceived intuitively as something that we wouldn't desire. Um, I don't know, very, uh, very disease uh, yeah. inflicting. I don't know. It it like, or, or, or it's very destruct. Like it, it auto destructs. Uh, I, 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 just imagine that the situation is horrible while the measure um, unexpected is, is is surprisingly high in biodiversity. Maybe like it's already crazy to think of, of just like a measure such as temperature uh, <coughs> is going from zero to one or something like that. But 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 suppose everything says good, uh, like a very high bi biodiversity, awful consequences. It seems like many like the intuition is that that is a good indicator for it being a bad measure for biodiverse diversity. Like scientists, I mean, that's my intuition, would look for, um, for ways to see, ah, no, 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 yeah, we've been measuring the wrong thing. Like we thought that, the, that it would be like nicely stable and, and not uh, be bad for us, nice to look at maybe even. Uh, so something like that. Uh, um, and, 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 and apparently due to the, the effects that it has, not due to uh, like the, the kind behind it, but the, the effect it has for us, we would not, we would think that maybe we've, 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 we've not touched on the right concept yet. In general it works well, but for specific cases you have these, they, because we've made it too precise, we get like contraintuitive uh, situations. And this would indicate that, like, it is normative. Uh, uh, if this sort of cases are conceivable, where because of it not being a pleasing outcome, uh, we, uh, 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 we 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 think we got on the wrong track. Uh, if that were the case, then I think it's clear that the concept, as we use it now, is normative. If not. If scientifically it's perfectly conceivable that we had to write very well defined concept uh, definition of the notion that even if it had uh, even some ecosystem turned out to be for us humans very bad but still very biodiverse, um, <coughs> then it would be an indicator that maybe we indeed we should the thing we are looking for is not uh, normative in nature. But, but, but I, I could have the completely opposite intuition. So I could also, from, 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 from this experience, I could also infer, well, maybe not every aspect of biodiversity um, is valuable. Not, not every, not all of biodiversity is valuable. So, and I mean, so since, since by, by, by definition, it also encompasses uh, microbial biodiversity um, and of course many microbials are pathogens. Um, one, could, one could also uh, make, make the claim. 
um, that it does not that it does not cover these cases. But I think that that's uh, to me that this would be counterintuitive. So the the intuitive way would be well um, it measures everything, um, and then the, the question is well which aspects are valuable for whatever reasons, and there may be very different such reasons. So. Aesthetic radiation is a thing, um, but this, of course, is stakeholder relative. Um, uh, there is option value, uh, there is instrumental value. For some, it's intrinsically valuable, which is also stakeholder relative. So I think that, the, um, that these are just two, two different things. Uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see why the concept should serve um, the, the purpose. Um, okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, to resist uh, the suggestion of uh, your colleague uh, that it, okay, it's not maybe it's I will use only a species diversities or a genetic diversity. It's what I need in the practice, and you want you still want to defend the multidisciplinary, multidimensionality of the concept. Probably the best way is, like you showed that a, a little bit, is true explanation and causal modeling. Because you could show. But one of the things that is important in that notion of causal modeling is that the information is not in the arrow, the information is where there's no arrow. In causal modeling, functional or statistical, an arrow is a possible causal link, but it could be zero. The, the real information in the model is where there's no error, because it's the only place you say, I'm certain there's no relations in the model. An arrow in the model could be, could be zero in the calculation, linear or nonlinear. So what would be important, I suppose, in the model, the example of a predatory, when you act on the predators and you have an effect, is is to be sure where there's no arrow that there's none. <laughs> and I suppose that in biological system it must be extremely difficult to establish a non-correlation or non-causal link. A possible causal link, the strength of it, okay, we could defer, but a non-relation. Because in causal modeling, the information is in when there's no arrow. But that, that's not that's a mathematical basic notion. So how, so, so if you think about this, how do you think we could establish in biology, so my first question, these, these non-arrow, these non-dependent, to be able to, to graph your multidimensionality, and after that the multidimensionality, you know, we were a little bit not nice to the researcher because you don't need the, the, the dimension to be orthonormal, to be real dimension, but you still have to show that they are non, non uh, collinear. You have to show at least partial independence between them, which I suppose is not easy also for from species diversity to genetic diversity. It's something difficult to show. That's, that's the reason why they do not include species richness, as I mentioned. Okay, so it's why they, they, mm. especially, especially they, they exclude that, but they still get the functional and the genetics. Yeah, the uh, phylogenetic. Okay, phylogenetics and okay. Yeah, yeah um, that's an, a very good point. Um, um, I would like to take that as a comment. <laughs> uh, no, okay. But I mean, but I think that it's just an, a suggestion to resist the, your colleague here that's saying, in practice, they only use one to do something, which is probably true. But if you want to say, oh, okay, but it's multidimensional, it's because an explanation, you could integrate this, this aspect in a, a certain concept of causal role of this big biodiversity in, in explanation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the oh, or, or, or your colleague could be right. There's no such thing. Yeah, that would, I mean, that would be the, a, a hypothesis, right? That mm. um, this this might be the case. But I'm, well, as of yet, I'm just not sure whether. I, I think so, because I forgot your name, sorry. Uh, Substantiates the claim. I forgot. Yeah. Thank you. 
I, I want to piggyback on this too, though, because I think there's something kind of cool in here that I that I like and want to. Uh, this is getting at something that I've that I've thought about off and on for a long time, and I'm finally going to write a paper on it soon because um, I'm working with somebody who wants to who wants to think about this. One thing that I think is really interesting here is so you have these part of what's going on in this debate. Let me let me back up. Sorry, my brain is is uh, not highly functional uh, this week. Um, Part of what's going on in this debate, right? You have these two different bodies of work. There's this one body of work that you point to that seems pretty clearly to essentially always atomize the biodiversity concept and right, never really use capital B biodiversity for anything. <coughs> um, you have this other kind of tantalizing idea, which I like, that like maybe there are parts of biodiversity research that do seem to use. But one thing that's, that there's, a, there's a more general question here that I've always, liked thinking about, and here I'm really just asking you to like wildly speculate and tell me what you think. Because part of what's at play then is when and how should we read things like the metaphysics of concepts off of these different kinds of biological research, right? What, when is it legitimate? When, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, Jack Justice can look at that first pile of work and say, look, so just obviously, like, bend this concept. Um, you want to push on the, other, on the other pile of work and say, here's another pile of work, maybe we don't bend the concept. Um, how, have you thought about how, like, sort of, what does an argument about that question look like for you? Because I've always thought that's a really cool question, and this is, I mean, I, I, I'm saying this in part because, like, I want to have an answer, I, I want to have a position on exactly, like, how this kind of engagement should work, and I don't have one. So I'm just wondering what you've thought about, because there's a, you're kind of dealing with a concrete instance of this kind of worry. I really am encouraging wild speculation so, here, so. I, honestly, honestly, I don't, um, I don't have thought about that yet. Um, but, um, I mean, I can clearly see that this is, um, that this is, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question weighs, weighs us itself, so. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm hard pressed to, to say anything, anything now. I mean, if you, so, um, because you mentioned you mentioned justice, so in, in, in his recent introduction to, to the philosophy of ecology, uh, this this book from 2021, um, he gives um, a very um, considerate discussion of the stability um, concept ah, okay. um, and of these different dimensions of stability. Um, and so I'm, uh, it, it, it's been a while since since I've read it, but I I thought that um, after reading that, well, maybe. Um, Maybe. So I was wondering why he wouldn't um, have the same approach or a similar approach to his discussion of the biodiversity concept. Um, so <clears throat> there, there is interesting. So he, so he keeps, he keeps stability. He wants to keep. Stability. <coughs> In that intro, he he doesn't argue. He's not an eliminativist about stability. I haven't read the book at all yet. I haven't picked it up yet. But uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know right now. Okay. Okay. It's, it's yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go look at that because that's this is uh, yeah. This is just really yeah. This is this is cool. Um, uh, I really like the I really like the the structured equation case. I think it's a really cool case for this for thinking more more deeply about this. Yeah. Uh, but so as a as a general rule, so when. So, so, so the question would be: When, in what cases, can we can we read off the metaphysics of the of the conceptual practice? So, I don't I don't know whether whether, whether one could say that there are general principles for right. for doing that. I mean, I, I really like the like the, um, the 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 question concerning the measurement issue um, because I, I think I would have to, um, to look much more um, deeply into that. Um, so and, and this could also be this could also be a criterion. Um, for this. So 
one, one way to look at it or to approach the issue would be to look first um, at the measurement history um, and to see whether a stable measure has developed um, and to make that as a criterion on um, whether we want to. Yeah, sure. For example, but that's, that's the only thing so on the top of my head that, that I could think right now. Sure. I think in the, sure. I think in the, in the biodiversity case, um, it was really just that uh, uh, that I, I stumbled upon this name framework, um, but also um, that these uh, that, that that ecologists were, were frequently pointing to how uh, structural equation modeling is used for in the social sciences, um, and trying to make an argument that they should apply a similar approach to representing their theoretical constructs. Um, and since I thought, well, this is interesting because some of them, they really make this out as an um, alternative approach to do their discipline um, and to treat the theoretical concepts in the discipline to, to, uh, to follow them. So, I don't know. Um, it might be the case that it is implausible in the case of biodiversity, but still this use of structural equation modeling could be interesting for other theoretical concepts. Sure. Cool. Actually, Juno Tsuka's played a little bit with this in selection and drift. Um, Same kind of causal equation, structural equation approaches uh, to thinking about, yeah, selection and drift. So yeah, that was also kind of a, using this to think about, to think about these kinds of relations is, yeah, is, 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 is I think it's really powerful. I have to look that up. Yeah. I'll, I can send you a, I can send you a thing, remind me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the last question. Oh, someone else. Okay, so, so if everything fails, <laughs> as it most likely will, there's the last point, the, la the last, the last thing you, you, you recite. You go back to the if if biodiversity is not stable as a concept, you go back to the the variety engine, the the, the productor of change, to see if the thing before produced something that is not not stable but you go back so natural selection drift you look at what produce this possible diversity and you look there if there's some stable thing that produce unstable thing that that are not a kind but still you go back and there possibly there's something very stable among the five source of change five is it five it was five now i don't know the five source of change in biology you know mutation selection oh yeah there's more drift, there's, a, there's a there's a there's a, there's a blah, dozen blah, blah, right? yeah and there's maybe something there that would that would be what that would have this use for defending politics and blah, yeah blah, 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 blah. but would be maybe hmm. a better better concept scientifically if if biodiversity is is uh, you're unable to stabilize that that thing mm -hmm. So you go back, you go in the source. That, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's why it's cool. But biology is a history, it's historical science. You can always go back to see the, the, the engine of change. But, but um, you're assuming that is the natural selection that is causing the diversity that you could... It could, could be something else. You could argue that it's the other way around. But without diversity, you also don't have anything to select for. Maybe. I say the first thing, the, his first project is to find a biodiversity, possibly multidimensional, to take account all the discourse. That is a stable notion. That, but if, it, if he cannot find any, he has to go somewhere if you want to get the same result. Or you could be wrong. Man. I think we have now fully arrived at beer caliber questions. <laughs> yes. So. Sure. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you.